Have you ever actually thought about what happens when you swipe your credit card? Like, really thought about it? You tap a piece of plastic against a machine, a beep sounds, transaction approved, and somehow, you just bought something. But what actually happened in that moment? Here at Simple Money, we've realized something fascinating. Most people use credit cards every single day without understanding the mechanics behind them. And that lack of understanding? It's costing people thousands of dollars every year. Today, I'm going to break down exactly what happens when you swipe your card. The technical process, the psychological process, and why understanding both might be the most important financial lesson you never learned. Here's what's really happening every time you use a credit card. You're not buying something. Not technically. You're entering into a complex financial transaction that involves at least four different companies, all happening in less than three seconds. And here's the wild part. Each of those companies is making money off your purchase, even if you never pay a cent in interest. Even if you pay off your balance every single month, money is changing hands, being extracted. From a transaction you thought was simple, think about the last thing you bought with a credit card. Maybe it was coffee, or lunch, or something online. You probably thought of it as a straightforward exchange. You wanted something. You paid for it. Done. But that's not what happened. What actually happened was way more complicated and way more expensive than you realize. Not expensive for you necessarily, but expensive for someone. And eventually, that cost trickles down to you anyway. Let me walk you through it step by step. Because once you understand the mechanics, you'll never look at credit cards the same way again. The first thing that happens is the merchant request. This is the moment you swipe, tap, or insert your card. Seems simple, but here's what's really going on. The card reader at the store captures information from your card. Your card number, expiration date, security code if it's a chip card. All of this gets encrypted and bundled into a transaction request. That request gets sent to the merchant's payment processor. This is a company you've never heard of. Companies like First Data or Chase Payment Tech. They're the middleman between the store and everyone else in this chain. This happens in milliseconds. You're still standing there waiting. The payment processor receives this request and immediately forwards it to your card network. Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover. Whatever logo is on your card. Now here's where it gets interesting. Your card network doesn't actually lend you money. Visa doesn't give you credit. Neither does MasterCard. They're just the communication network. Think of them like the phone company. They connect the call, but don't participate in the conversation. The card network takes that transaction request and routes it to your actual bank, the one that issued your credit card. Chase, Bank of America, Capital One, whoever. This is the moment of truth. Your bank receives the transaction request, checks your account in real time. Do you have enough available credit? Is this transaction suspicious? Is your card reported stolen? All of these checks happen in fractions of a second. If everything looks good, your bank approves the transaction, sends an approval code back through the same chain, card network to payment processor to merchant. The whole round trip takes about two to three seconds. The register beeps. Transaction approved. You grab your coffee and leave. But the actual movement of money? That hasn't even started yet. The second phase is what I call the settlement dance. And this is where things get expensive for everyone involved. At the end of each business day, the merchant batches all their transactions together, sends them through their payment processor for settlement. This is when money actually starts moving, but not the way you think. Here's what happens. Your bank, the one that issued your credit card, pays the merchant's bank, but not the full amount. Let's say you bought something for $100. Your bank might pay the merchant's bank $98. Where did the other $2 go? That's called the interchange fee, and it goes to your bank, the one that issued your credit card. They keep it as payment for offering you credit and taking on the risk of your purchase. But wait, there's more. The card network, Visa or MasterCard, also takes a cut. Usually small, maybe 15 to 20 cents. They call it a network assessment fee, payment for running the transaction through their system. And the payment processor? They take a cut too. Maybe another 20 to 30 cents, plus a small percentage. Payment for handling the technical infrastructure. Add it all up and the merchant isn't receiving $100 for your $100 purchase. They're receiving somewhere between $97 and $98. The rest got divided up among all the middlemen. Now you might be thinking, okay, so what? The merchant loses 2 or 3%. Why should I care? I'm not paying it. 
But here's the thing. You are paying it, just indirectly. Think about it from the merchant's perspective. They're losing 2 to 3% on every credit card transaction. That's a real cost, a cost they have to cover somehow. How do they cover it? They raise prices, not explicitly. You won't see a credit card fee at most stores. That's actually prohibited by card network rules in many cases. But merchants factor this cost into their pricing. Everyone's prices are slightly higher to cover credit card processing fees. This means even if you pay cash, you're paying prices that are inflated to cover other people's credit card fees. You're subsidizing rewards programs you don't even benefit from. It's a hidden tax on everyone, built into the cost of everything. The third phase is what I call the credit float. And this is where credit cards fundamentally differ from debit cards. This is where the psychology gets weaponized. Remember, when you swiped your card, your bank paid the merchant, but you haven't paid your bank yet. That comes later, usually 30 days later when your statement is due. This creates a time gap, a float period, where you've received goods or services but haven't actually paid for them yet. You're essentially getting a short-term loan, interest-free if you pay on time. Sounds great, right? Free money for a month. And if you're disciplined, it is great. Use the card, pay it off every month, never pay interest, collect rewards, win. But here's what most people don't realize. This float period is exactly what makes credit cards psychologically dangerous. Because that time gap between purchase and payment, it breaks the psychological connection between spending and losing money. Think about it. When you buy something with cash, you hand over the money immediately. You see it leave your hand. Your wallet gets lighter. Your brain registers a loss right now in this moment. When you buy something with a debit card, the money leaves your account within a day or two. You can check your bank balance and see it decrease. The connection is still pretty direct. Spend money. See balance drop. But with a credit card? You spend money today and your bank account balance doesn't change. Not today, not tomorrow, not for weeks. Your brain doesn't register a loss because technically you haven't lost anything yet. You've just made a promise to pay later. This delay is everything. It's the entire psychological trick. It's what makes credit cards feel painless. And that painless feeling is what makes people spend more. Studies have shown this repeatedly. People spend more with credit cards than with any other payment method. Same people, same items, same stores. The only variable is payment method. And credit cards consistently lead to higher spending. Why? Because the pain of paying has been separated from the pleasure of buying. You get all the dopamine of acquiring something new right now. But the pain of losing money is delayed by 30 days, by which time you've probably made 20 more purchases, each one feeling equally painless. This is the real profit center for credit card companies, not the interchange fees, not the processing fees. Those are nice. But the real money comes from people who carry balances. People who don't pay off their cards every month. The fourth element is what I call the interest trap. And this is where credit cards transform from a payment tool into a profit machine for banks. Let's say you don't pay off your full balance. You pay the minimum. Or you pay most of it but leave some balance. That remaining balance starts accruing interest. Usually somewhere between 15 and 25% annual percentage rate. Here's where the math gets ugly. That interest compounds daily, not monthly, not annually, daily, which means every single day you're being charged interest on your balance plus the previous day's interest. Let's run a real example. You have a $2,000 balance on a card with 20% interest. You make only minimum payments, typically around 2 to 3% of the balance. Your first month's interest is about $33, so your minimum payment might be $60 which means $41 goes to interest and only $19 goes to actually reducing your balance. Next month, you still owe $1,981 plus interest. The cycle continues. And at this rate, it will take you over 11 years to pay off that $2,000 debt. And you'll pay over $2,000 in interest, doubling the cost of whatever you originally bought. This is what credit card companies are really betting on. They're not hoping you pay off your balance every month. That's the worst case scenario for them. They make a tiny interchange fee and that's it. They're hoping you'll carry a balance, even a small one, because that balance generates interest. Month after month, year after year, that's where the real profit lives. And the numbers are staggering. 
The average American household with credit card debt carries over $8,000 in balances and pays over $1,000 per year in interest alone. That's $1,000 that produces nothing, builds nothing, goes nowhere except into bank profits. But here's what makes this trap so effective. Credit cards are designed to make carrying a balance feel normal, acceptable, even smart. They offer minimum payments that are always affordable. They send you messages saying you've earned a month off from payments. They increase your credit limit so your balance doesn't feel as large relative to available credit. Every feature is designed to keep you in debt longer. Because longer debt means more interest. And more interest means more profit. For them, the fifth element is what I call the rewards manipulation. And this is the most psychologically sophisticated part of the entire system. Credit card companies offer rewards to make you feel like you're winning. Cash back, points, miles, perks. It all feels like free money, like you're beating the system somehow. But remember what I said earlier about interchange fees? When you bought something for $100, the merchant only received $97 or $98. The other $2 to $3 got split among various parties. Where do you think rewards come from? They come from those fees. Your 2% cash back? That's coming out of the interchange fee your bank collected from the merchant. They're just giving you a portion of the fee they already collected. It's not free money. It's not a gift. It's a marketing expense to make you use the card more. And it works brilliantly. People chase rewards. They choose where to shop based on rewards categories. They put everything on credit cards to maximize points. And in the process, they spend more. Way more than the value of the rewards. Let me show you how this plays out in real life with two different people. Meet Marcus. Marcus got his first credit card in college. Nothing fancy, just a basic student card with a $500 limit. He used it occasionally, paid it off, everything was fine. After graduation, Marcus got a job, started earning real money. His credit card company noticed, increased his limit to $3,000, sent him offers for better cards with rewards programs. Marcus upgraded. Now he's earning 2% cash back on everything. Marcus starts using his card for everything. Groceries, gas, restaurants, subscriptions. Why not? He's earning rewards on every purchase. Feels smart. Feels responsible. Here's what Marcus's month looks like. He swipes his card for a $70 dinner with friends. Doesn't really think about it. He's earning points. He buys a $200 jacket he's been eyeing. The card makes it easy. No need to check his bank account first. He subscribes to three new streaming services because they're only $10 each per month. Barely noticeable. He upgrades his phone plan. Orders take out more often. Each individual purchase feels small, manageable, justified. End of the month, his statement arrives. $3,200. Marcus stares at this number. That's more than his rent. Way more than he expected. He earned $64 in cash back. Nice. But where did all this spending come from? He looks through the transactions. Every single one is legitimate. Nothing frivolous. Everything made sense at the time. But somehow they added up to way more than he intended to spend. Marcus doesn't have $3,200 to pay this off, so he pays $2,000. Leaves a balance of $1,200. He'll pay it off next month when things are less tight. But next month, the same thing happens. More swipes. More taps, more painless transactions. Another $3,000 statement. He pays it down, but never quite to zero. There's always a balance. Always interest accruing. Always money disappearing. Fast forward a year. Marcus is carrying a consistent balance of around $2,000. He's paying about $30 per month in interest. That's $360 per year. Remember those rewards he earned? About $700 over the year. Sounds great until you subtract the $360 in interest. His net benefit is $340. But here's the real cost. Marcus spent more because of the credit card. Studies show credit cards increase spending by 15 to 20% on average. If Marcus would have spent $30,000 with cash or debit, he probably spent about $35,000 with credit cards instead. That extra $5,000 in spending? It's gone and he has nothing to show for it except a persistent debt balance and a pile of things he barely remembers buying. Now meet Keisha. Keisha also got a credit card. Same bank, same offers, same rewards program. But Keisha does something different. Before getting the card, Keisha did something weird. 
She researched how credit cards actually work, watched videos, read articles, learned about interchange fees and psychological tricks. She understood something crucial. Credit cards are designed to make her spend more. Not might make her spend more, will make her spend more. It's baked into the system, proven by decades of data. So Keisha created rules. She uses her credit card only for planned purchases. Big items she's already budgeted for. Things she'd buy anyway. Everything else? Debit card. Why? Because Keisha realized the rewards aren't worth it if they cause her to overspend by even 5%. She'd rather leave rewards on the table than fall into the psychological trap. When Keisha grocery shops? Debit card. When she goes out to eat? Debit card. Daily coffee? Debit card. She feels those purchases. Sees the money leave her checking account? Her brain registers spending as spending. She uses the credit card for planned expenses. Her monthly internet bill. Her car insurance. A specific purchase she's already decided to make. Then she pays it off immediately. Same day if possible. Definitely before the statement even arrives. Does Keisha earn less in rewards than Marcus? Yes. Probably about $300 per year versus his $700. But here's what Keisha gains. She pays zero in interest. Zero. That alone saves her $360 compared to Marcus. But more importantly, she spends way less overall because she's not constantly swiping a card that makes spending feel painless. At the end of the year, Keisha has earned less in rewards, but she saved more money. Her net worth is growing while Marcus's stays flat, and she's not carrying debt or paying interest to anyone. Here's what most people don't realize. The credit card game is rigged, not in the sense that you can't win. You can, but you have to understand the rules. The real rules, not the ones they advertise. The real rules are these. Credit cards are engineered to make you spend more. The rewards are bait. The convenience is a trap. The float period breaks your psychological connection to spending. And if you slip even once, the interest will eat you alive. It's not about discipline. Marcus isn't weak. He's not irresponsible. He's just a normal person using a financial tool that's designed to exploit normal human psychology. He's fighting uphill against behavioral science, against decades of optimization, against his own brain. Keisha isn't superhuman. She doesn't have more willpower. She just understood the system well enough to opt out of the parts that were designed to hurt her. She kept the benefits and avoided the traps. Not through willpower, through system design. What actually happens when you swipe your card isn't just a technical transaction. It's a psychological event. One that's been carefully engineered to separate you from your money while making you feel good about it. The merchant request, the settlement dance, the credit float, the interest trap, and the rewards manipulation. These aren't neutral features. They're designed this way, intentionally, to maximize profit for credit card companies and banks. Every beep at the register represents a complex web of fees and incentives that most people never think about. Money being extracted at every step from the merchant, from you, from everyone in the system. Understanding this doesn't mean you should never use credit cards, but it means you should use them differently. With eyes wide open, knowing that every swipe is a psychological test, you might fail without even realizing it. The question isn't whether credit cards are good or bad. The question is whether you understand them well enough to use them without being used by them. And now that you know what really happens when you swipe that card, you can't pretend you don't.